Hello and welcome to my channel, Reading Little Blue Books, out loud. This is a little blue book. It happens to be little blue book number 1536 and it is titled Facing Death Fearlessly and it is written by Joseph McCabe. And let's see, is there a copyright? Yes, it is copyright 1930 and this is part two. We left off at the top of page 18. There was no such thing as a purposive equipment of the organism with instincts to avoid danger. In the infin infinite variety of life some organisms had in higher proportion than others that combination of sensitiveness, acuteness of perception, speed of reaction, vigor of muscle, and so on, which make an animal less likely to die young. Naturally, these transmitted their quality and it increased and was intensified. It is not so much the horror of the unknown or the reluctance to leave life, which in such cases has nothing to regret, that so often checks the suicide. It is the violence to that deep and general urge or instinct which millions of years of evolution have developed. In the elderly this is often just as naturally enfeebled though my experience is that it is enfeebled far less than is generally, generally supposed. A great cardinal died when I was young and quite pious professor in a mon monastic college and I happened to meet a bishop who had been in intimate with him to the end. Speaking quite sincerely on the lines of our beliefs, I said to the bishop, I suppose he was glad to go. I meant, of course, that he saw heaven opening to him, but the bishop astonished me by telling me that the cardinal had fought vigorously to retain life to the very end. In normal circumstances, where a man still has an interesting work to do or life still offers more pleasure of one kind or another than annoyance, the instinct persists. In some the consequences no in some the consciousness of danger makes it even sharper, and the old man or woman of seventy five will exhibit a terribly selfish or even humorous clinging to life. Religion makes no difference difference in such cases, but proper mental cultivation does, and that is why the skeptic is more apt to have what John Ruskin called a brave attitude toward death. The typical skeptic, who has passed the three score years and ten, or is at an even earlier age, aware that he has entered what I may call the death zone, takes every reasonable precaution to avoid illness or injury but he shows no nervous or comic profusion of precautions. I have in mind at the moment several ladies over seventy skeptics. Life is worth living to them, and they take no superfluous risk. But they are quite but they are quite quiet and reasonable about it. Not like so many of the Christian old ladies who you see insisting that the whole world shall help to keep them out of heaven as long as possible. I know a number of skeptics over 75 and some over 80. They smile every New Year's Day. This year surely will be the last, they say to themselves genially. They are quite resigned to go. They have worn, warmed both hands at the fire of life. They have been fortunate and are ready, like Henley, to thank whatever gods there are. I have known, too, quite a number of men who have committed suicide. Sometimes it was not easy to understand. Three rationalists I knew committed suicide within a few years of each other, and they were all men of good health, not over sixty, and fairly prosperous. They left no explana explanation and had not discussed the matter with anybody. All left wives, but all left wives, but the wives were decently provided for, and no one was injured by their death. Such men have, of course, a perfect right to end this story prematurely. I had for many years the idea that I should probably make my exit gracefully 
and with as little mess as possible, on my sixtieth birthday. For years, one thing that restrained me was that some of my children still needed me. One, unexpectedly, still needs my aid, and this American work for Hadelman Julius has brought a new interest into my life. So the Harry Carey is postponed. But I still propose to close my life with my life when I think fit, and I often discuss in my mind how it is advisable to arrange the exit. Probably from a boat at sea, so that hypocritical rationalists may not make speeches over my body or attend my funeral. I say these things, believe me, in exactly the same simple and natural way as I would tell, if it interested anybody, what sort of clothes I mean to have next. I am talking about myself only because naturally the skeptical attitude toward death is best known to me in my own mind. There is one difference, perhaps. In some cases I have admi admired what I would call the bravery or courage of skeptics who confronted death or were willing for the good of the race, in the case of certain scientists, for instance, to run a very serious risk of it. There is no bravery at all in my attitude, so that I am not in the least boasting. Death has not the least element of terror for me, so that I have phys psychologically neither fear nor courage. There is, in fact, a part of my attitude that I cannot very well explain. My once My wants are very simple, and I have all I want. My health is, for my age, exceptionally good, and I am never tired or in the least depressed. However, let me leave that I take let me leave that and take such elements of my frame of mind as are common to educated skeptics. The first and most important element is that I have for thirty years been quite certain that there is no truth in any variety or shade of religious belief, or belief in the existence of a spiritual world. Sincere religious people fail to understand the effect of this, but it is quite simple and natural. I am not thinking of preachers who live in an intellectual atmosphere of fictions and false arguments and conventions but of religious men and women who I have found by conversation with them, find it difficult to believe my assurance that the thought of death leaves my imagination quite unstimulated and my feeling quite unruffled. They do not realize how their conception of the skeptic's attitude is colored by a literature which is ultimately based on the convenient Catholic fiction, that every man who knows the evidence for the faith and does not admit does not admit, admit it is a liar, convenient because it furnished a plausible reason for putting critics to death. I have one of those little popular manuals in which Americans are taught what Catholics really hold today and how they are slandered by wicked Protestants and rationalists. On the first page it tells how, you un, how unjust it is to say that Catholics believe that all non-Catholics will go to hell. A pope is quoted to the effect that ignorance of the true religion when it is invincible releases a man from punishment. How humane! It really means that if a man, through no fault of his own, has never had Catholic truth put before him, take an ancient Greek, for instance, he will not be punished eternally for not being a Catholic. God is certainly merciful. In fact, this doctrine of invincible ignorance is so vapid and elementary that this Calvert handbook of Catholic facts gives it an entirely new meaning. It says that the universal teaching of Catholic moralists is in accord with the above declaration that only those are lost eternally who, having come to full knowledge of the Catholic faith, and believing in its truths, refuse to follow it. The words I have, I, 
italicized, which make the sentence absurd or quite mendicious addition to the Catholic doctrine. Where is the ignorance, vincible or invincible? If you believe in Catholicism, then how on earth can you refuse to follow it if you believe? For this question of invincible ignorance has nothing to do with bad Catholics, men who believe but refuse to practice. Catholic teaching is now Catholic teaching is now in America and everywhere out everywhere else and always was that any man who knows the Catholic doctrine and the evidence of them and shows that he does not believe them is in a state of vincible ignorance ignorance or willing refusal and will be damned. That is the real reason why the stories of infidel deathbeds began to be invented. Voltaire did believe, Catholic said, for he knew the truth, and the sublime conceit is that Catholic teaching is so luminously true, the doctrine of absolution, the mass, or the immaculate conception, for instance, that any man who knows it must believe it. So pious folk imagined infidels writhing in terror when the end approached, and pious forgers confirmed them, as they have done since the death of Arius in the 4th century with fictitious stories of agony. It is this ancient myth that still influences religious literature and prevents many, even conscientious Christians, from understanding skeptics. One can imagine that it might lead to distress, possibly misery. If a man who all his life had believed in God and looked forward to an eternity of bliss were to discover shortly before his death that, there were super, that they were superstitions. I have, on that account, never sought to interfere with the religious beliefs of aged people in practice. However, even this contingency must be very rare. For I have never heard of a case, the mind very quickly and easily reconciles itself to the idea that life is limited, not immortal. Few can have had a wider experience than I of men and women who have abandoned the belief in immortality, but in the thousands of letters I have received from such people, I have never had an expression of regret. Imagine the feelings of a man who had for twenty or thirty years lived with a belief which he had reason to regard as certain, that at fifty he would receive a large or comfortable, for comfortable fortune, and then finding that it was an error. Only the man of powerful restraint would not suffer. Most men would suffer considerably. Yet thousands every year discover the promise of something which is supposed to be infinitely greater is illusionary. And neither in life nor in literature do we find any resentment or dejection. Emile's journey might be journal might be quoted against me and you have to go back 50 years for that. But even here, the distress of this hypersensitive and very exceptional writer is not so much due to specific doubt about immortality as a general regret that he cannot enter into the Christian life. Any man who can understand this at first sight, singular fact, will understand the attitude of the skeptic toward death. I would not stress the fact that he is relieved of any misgivings as the eternal torment. My own clerical experience was the very few was that very few really had a vivid fear or even an acute anxiety about it. To become and remain a world power, Christianity had to invent all kinds of evasions of its terrible dogma. Instantaneous, unexpected death is very rare, and it is Catholic teaching at least that if a man has time to murmur, even mentally, I am sorry, he escapes hell. It is only in small sects or limited periods, like that of the New England Puritans, that hell really terrified people. To me, the only explanation seems to be that few men ever had the same conviction about a future life as they have of this life. Ask them if they believe in this post mortem existence and they reply yes certainly but they will read a book criticizing the belief without the slightest flutter of nerve 
and they will, if the book induces them to surrender the belief, feel no regret. The psychology of this seems so illogical that one must suppose that the belief was never deep-rooted enough to tear their emotions when it is removed, and that the period of inquiry, doubt and increasing uncertainty steadily, steadily dissolves whatever connection with the feeling that belief ever had. I detest all compromises with the belief, and personal immorality seems to me to have no more cheerful relation to the old dream of personal immorality than materialism has. The stuff of which I am composed will not be annihilated, and it does not seem to matter two pins whether it is material or spiritual, as long as the I disappears. Nor have I ever found any consolation in the fact that, as my positivist friend friends remind me, I shall be immortal in my work or in the thoughts of those who owe me something. That's one memory. That's one that one's memory should be maintained for a few years with honor and affection by a few has no relation whatever to immortality. And as to living on in my work or the thoughts of others, it is a kind of vanity from which I have never suffered. There may be folk who appreciate these things. To most of us, they are simply irrelevant. The limited duration of our existence is a fact like any other. We loathe death only when it steals the young. The most painful of all sights that I, re that I encounter on the streets of this great metropolis is to meet the death car and notice as it passes that the dead was young. Only once has the dream of immortality stirred my pulse since. More than thirty years ago, I surrendered it, and on that occasion it stirred me to the depths of my nature. It was when I saw on the stage Maurice Masterlink's Bluebird. My recollection is rather faded, but I seem to remember the two wandering children stumbling upon a pleasant land in the forest where all their dead playmates still lived and played as they had done on earth. Nay, they were still on earth, still children of, na of naive Im impulses. That was the beauty of the idea, but it had no relation to the Christian or any other idea of immortality. It was as Masterlink meant it to be, just an exquisite fiction. Your genuine immoralist always kills their bodies, and we go, and we do not care to think of them without the gentle, wandering eyes, the warm impulses, the restless, beautiful limbs. No religion. Let me see. Let me try that again. No, religion never relieves the gloom of that tragedy. It waits upon the growing wisdom of man. It is less frequent every decade, and though it can never wholly disappear from this planet. The final conquest of disease and the mastery of the human frame will ensure that there will be much less suffering from this cause. And the more we secure that nearly all shall enjoy at least a decade or two of adult life, the more we shall take the sting out of death. Even at forty, even earlier, a man can find satisfaction enough in twenty or thirty-five years, tw twenty or twenty-five years of pleasure to die without repining. But at fifty or sixty, the only mystery to me is why people suppose that we should confront death with any terror. At seventy, I almost dread the thought of my life at that stage, but I suppose one's psychology changes with the years. It is not impossible that in one more generation men will still have at seventy the feeling of vitality, of adventure, of achievement which makes life worth maintaining. Apart from age, we have only the study we have only to study the development of thought to conclude that the general attitude toward death will become that which is spontaneously developed in us skeptics today. I speak of meeting death fearlessly, but I do not but I do not so much mean by the strength which conquers fear as that the source of fear will gradually disappear. Life is going to offer very much more to everybody than it does today, and one of the things it is going 
it is going not merely to offer but to give will be a sane education. When we get rid of the idea that there is a providence behind the scheme of things, we find ourselves in the mood of the good-natured gambler. It is just an open question how long we shall enjoy the roses and the sunshine. Impatience about it, fretting that we have not a safe 70-year lease, worrying about the uncertainty of our tenure is merely silly. A girl may regret that she is not as beautiful as a film star, a young man that he is not as clever as Edison or as successful as Ford, but they rarely shed tears over it. One can be a fatalist, a stoic, in regard to the thought of death without any lessening or coarsening of one's emotion. I remember still the account which Nevison brought home from Russia during the worst days of the pre-war terror in Russia. When as people are so apt to forget the czars, forget the czarists were as brutal and bloody as any Bolsheviks, and reported to have been since the war. Nevinson, Nevin, Nevin's son is a keen observer and conscientious, conscientious, wow, conscientious man. And he said that the indifference to death of the young students was amazing. They coolly, coolly stitched to their clothes tags with their names on and went out into the streets. If soldiers opened fire, they did not run or dart into doorways. They walked on until they dropped. The annals of Russia since the first half of the 19th century are full of these things. It is not, as some say, Asiatic fatalism, Tartar blood in the veins of Russia, for there is very little Tartar blood in the Russian people. It is the attitude of the skeptic toward death. In the history of Japan, one finds innumerable illustrations of it, even in the case of youths and maidens. We may hope that within another half century, the need of such sacrifice or stoicism in the young will have disappeared from the earth. There is a fine quality of manliness in those who can, even in youth, face the risk of death with a smile, who feel that the adventure is worth the risk, as there is something repellent in those who shrink too nervously from even from every suspicion of risk. Nietzsche's live in danger, not live dangerously to others, as anti-Nietzscheans make him say, contains a very fine maxim. Put in the extreme and the paradoxical form which Nietzsche found best fitted for his message. But we are pioneers in the age of transition, often wandering into false directions, often driven into positions which are merely suited to our pioneering conditions. Someday, education, the broad education that begins in the nursery and the primary school and continues throughout life, will consistently embody a sane and natural attitude toward life, which means also an attitude toward death. It will impose on the community the duty to see that as few lives as possible end prematurely, or are so poor in quality that the thought of suicide may arise. It will give the individual a pride and joy in life, a frank acceptance of every pleasure that does not mean pain for another, a spontaneous feeling of real comradeship. But it will give also a quiet feeling that premature de death is just a piece of ill luck that we must try to avoid, and death in old age is natural as sleep at the close of the day's work. There will still be pain, the pain of the bereaved, for it is a foolish supposition that feeling will be less acute when intellect is more cultivated. But there will be a general sense of the naturalness of death that will make a man prepared for loss and a stronger to meet it. In short, human nature is more natural than some of these puzzled Christians realize. I once won $500 by writing an article on a funeral at sea. I mean, I was put down in some man's will for that sum, though I shall probably precede him into silence. On one of my voyages a passenger died, and the Church of England service was read over the body. I happened to know that the man had died of venereal 
perennial disease perennial disease and had left his widow unprovided for and when I saw the poor woman standing on the deck near the pathetic body and reflected on the nature of the death I was filled with anger to hear a smug clergyman assuring his uh, assuring his almighty that we thanked him for taking this his servant unto himself I retired to my cabin and wrote an article on the official church attitude toward death and one who had just and one who had just buried his father with the same church service though both were agnostics and read my article yeah, and read my article was so pleased with my expression of his own contempt that he put me in a codicil to his will yet the people who listened to these empty and inse insincere mumblings over the dead profess that they cannot understand our manly and reasonable attitude toward it thirty odd years ago when I was teaching in a Catholic college a, hop a hodgepodge of bits of modern science and chunks of medieval verbiage which we called philosophy it was part of my business to find a definition of death there were many but only one accurate definition death is a, is a cessation of life it is our conception of life that matters we soon grow accustomed to the thought that this thing we call life is the activity of a machine that runs down like a watch or wears out like an automobile we smile at the idea that we fret and fume and weep because in a universe of dissolution we are not eternal machines healthy and instinctively we keep the machine from dangerous injury but the ultimate cessation becomes becomes to us so familiar and fitting an idea that it no more strikes the chords of emotion than does the idea of digestion or respiration an educated Chinaman coming for the first time to study American or European thought might be pardoned if he fancied that we parven parven that we parven use in skepticism he and his an ancestors have been enlightened for two thousand years must be troubled at the discovery of the f falseness of the gorgeous promise of immortality which we have cherished for two millennia somehow the world never was the first considerable growth of such skepticism seems to have been in Italy under the influence of that wonder of the world Friedrich II Florence as Dante indicates was full of cultivated men who rejected the belief in eternal life and there was no grayer more progressive more enlightened city in Europe nature is not injured when the illusion of the supernatural is removed from it the mind when the mind then develops normally it has no fear of death because there is nothing in death to fear we hold it off cheerfully as long as we can and then serenely accept the last anesthetic and that is the end of book number one five whoops three six facing death fearlessly written by joseph mccabe copyright 1930 Thank you.